to a lost world. In Jesus' name we pray. You know, Richard this morning is going to preach on you know, the awesomeness of God. I know we're going to sing Awesome God here later. But it's amazing to think that the creator of the world you know, loved us so much that he sent his son to bleed and die, even though he didn't deserve it, and we did deserve it. That his love for us was so great that he allowed his son to live and die for us. So let's really focus on that as we prepare to meet around the table this morning. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all
I'd like to read Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5 through verse 11. As the Apostle Paul writes, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Yes, Jesus sacrificed his life, but he also sacrificed being in the presence of God. He sacrificed that to come to this earth, to be born a human, a humble human at that, not from a rich or powerful family, but was born to a young girl and her carpenter husband. And while born in Bethlehem, he was raised in Nazareth, up in Galilee, where many people questioned because a good Jew did not really consider the people in Galilee to be as good as they should. But that's Jesus. He didn't come just to minister to those who were rich and powerful. He ministered to those who were in need, who were hurting, who needed God. And so, at this time, we think about that sacrifice. And the love that it took for God to offer his only son, and for Jesus to leave the glory of heaven, walk this earth, to die in the manner that he did, but most importantly, to be resurrected, to overcome death, so that we can have eternal life with him. As we prepare to take of the bread that represents Christ's body, shall we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Our most holy and heavenly Father, we, we come before you. And Father, we are so thankful for that sacrifice for us and the love that it took. Father, we're thankful for that ministry and his life and his example and his teachings. And then his obedience to your will as he offered himself on that cross. Father, at this time we partake of this bread in remembrance of Jesus as he asked. As we think about what was done for us, Father, we think of his body on that cross. Father, let us... Uh, Think on these things at this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shall we return to our Father in prayer? Our Holy and Heavenly Father, we are preparing to take of the cup, the fruit of the vine, that represents the blood that Christ shed on the cross. The blood, Father, that washes over us and makes us white as snow, washes away all of our sins so that we are fully reconciled, 
so we can come before you clean, blameless. And so that we are your children. And so, Father, the blood that washes over us allows us to, to be in that right relationship with you and to look forward to the glories of heaven. Or we'll be able to stand in the presence of you, of Christ our Lord. And Father, may we think on these things as we partake of the cup at this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we have spent these moments thinking about the wonderful sacrifice that Jesus made for us, we now have an opportunity to sacrifice back, to give back to God, a portion of which we've been blessed. And as you're aware, we're not going to be passing the plates. But we do have in the back boxes where you can leave your contribution. You can give online through the church website or through the Breeze app or mail a check, or drop off your contribution here at the church building. But in whatever manner you choose to give, we pray that you do so with a cheerful and loving heart in recognition of what God has done. So shall we return to our Father in prayer. Our holy and heavenly Father, we have spent these moments thinking about the love you have for us and what was offered for us. And so now, Father, we can give back to you. Father, you've blessed us in so many ways. And as we contribute the monies that we do, Father, we know that it will be used to further spread your kingdom, to share the gospel message of what Jesus did for us, to share the message of the love that you have for us and the home in heaven that you have ready for us. The money that we use, Father, to help those in need. And we have many needs in our country at this time. And to further your kingdom. And so, Father, we pray that the monies that are given are truly done with a cheerful heart. And in recognition and just sheer thankfulness for all that you've done for us. We are so thankful. We are so loved. And we thank you for all that you do. It's in Christ's name we pray. He is able, Lord, and able to accomplish what concerns me today. Thank you. 
together. Thank you, Michael. Um, have some prayers for, um, if you can, involve for your, your prayers this morning. Very heartfelt. It's always good to hear you, brothers. Um, and we are thankful that we can get together and have some family time, which is what we're going to do right now. Um, we have a lot of prayer requests that we continue to have out in the front. Uh, if you need a list, um, there are some that you can pray over through this week and continue to pray for our families and who are struggling with health issues. Um, we are so thankful that, in essence, um, Hurricane Laura, although it did go right through Lake Charles and some other places, um, we have friends and family in New Iberia and others and locations in there, and I know... Uh, there's a lot of people affected by that, but I'm thankful that the, the um, that loss of life was very, very low for that. I've actually got a family, you know, Tucker's just moved to Houston. I don't know why, but <laughs> I, don't know if you, I don't know why you'd want to live in Houston, but that's my personal opinion. <laughs> but uh, we, were, we were a little bit concerned about that, just not having hurricanes in our family. Now we're, uh, we, I guess they've lived through their first hurricane and it, it passed. It didn't really affect Houston too much. So that, was, that was good. Um, we just want to remember uh, Yvonne Tempa uh, as she continues her treatments for cancer. Uh, I know Glenna Cooper has an appointment tomorrow that we want to keep in our prayers as well. And um, I heard that uh, Patty Eisenbaugh's right foot is not healing correctly. And so we want to pray for Patty and, um, and proper healing there. Um, I had heard that Royce uh, Calhoun got some good news from his test, so we're thankful for that. Um, and uh, I don't think Josiah is here today, but I heard he turned 14 yesterday, so that's kind of cool uh, for the Rosnett family. And uh, we are thankful for them. And I did hear from Christina Wagner this morning. Um, fortunately, her cousin, Robert Calvin, uh, is in ICU with COVID. Uh, it's not doing well. And, you know, this, this virus is really, really odd. Because, you know, it affected my son, and he was fine, but it affects others, and they get really sick. Uh, so we just have to be careful with this. And so we want to keep Robert uh, in our prayers as well for Christina. We have a few really um, hard news to share this morning as well. Uh, Charlotte Huff's sister, um, I heard yesterday, passed away. And she's been struggling for a while, and so we want to keep the Huff family in our prayers we also know that Rick Amory has been struggling with health over the past few months, and that's been that's been difficult for him and Sherry to deal with. We heard last night, though, um, and this is where it gets difficult, because they're a sweet family and, and very dear friends of ours, too, is that Tyler, their son, died yesterday. We don't know why. Um... I guess it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So Sherry and Rick are, are devastated, I'm sure. Um, you know, he's survived by his wife Amy and his sweet daughter Riley, who's been attending with us off and on over the past years. So we need to keep Amy in, in our prayers um, and just surround this family 
with love and kindness and prayers and, you know, and reach out to them as we can. So let's do that right now as a family together here in person and online. And, and I just um, I pray that we can somehow help uh, and, and comfort them in this time. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, oh comforting God, we know there are several that we just mentioned that are suffering, Lord, from sickness. We just pray, we know that you are in control of all this, Lord, that you can you can heal those and you can comfort those, Lord. We know that um, you are all powerful. We do thank you, God, for just being able to do all this, Lord. We thank you, God, for being in our being able, allowing us to be in your presence this morning. Um, it's just a powerful thing, uh, Lord, and it's we just need to be together. We need to be worshiping you. So we thank you, God, for your Son and all that He has done for us as sacrifice. Lord, without this. Without what Jesus had done, it would just be all for naught. So, Lord, we do we do pray and uh, that you'd be with Yvonne as she continues her treatment, and, and Glenna, um, and Patty as uh, she's trying to heal. Lord, we also pray you um, a prayer of thanksgiving for Royce and, and, and Josiah as they celebrate in different ways. And Lord, we also pray you be with uh, Robert, our, our, our brother in Christ, who's suffering with COVID. Lord, just help Christina and her family. And Lord, a special prayer of comfort for the Huff family as they, uh, they've lost a loved one there. And of course, the Amberby family as they've lost a son. And Lord, we just ask that you would be with them, that you would uh, help them heal, help them, give them peace, Lord through this time and help us to do whatever we can to surround them with love. Lord, we I know that um, in Revelations you say that you will wipe away every tear, Lord. And we want to believe that. Help us to have strength during those times of, of loss. And, and Lord, just help us to be a strong family to, to the Ambergies and the Huffs and others who are struggling. Help us to be strong Christians. And Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time together with us, and we continue to want to do everything we can to just be a great example of your love and your son's love and what you've done for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we have the song before the lesson. How great is our God. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself Oh, 
And the reason it should be, the kingdom should be a place of power is because the king is powerful. Psalm 66 and verse 7 says, For by his great power he rules forever. So that's what we want to talk about for just a few minutes today. Is we want to talk about God's mighty great power. And, and the first thing we want to look at is, is how God's power is evidenced. And we could spend all day talking about how God's power is evidenced. But, but we're just going to kind of concentrate on two things. And the first one, God's power is evidenced by his creation. Uh, God's creation gives absolute irrefutable testimony to the power of God. I mean, you just read Genesis chapter 1. And you think about it, you're, you're overwhelmed by the power of God. All God had to do was speak the word. And everything that is came into creation. And it wasn't hard for him. It didn't stress him out. He didn't strain him. He didn't break out in a sweat. You know, he, he didn't pull a muscle. It was easy for him. And the reason he rested on the seventh day was not so much that he was all tired out. It was because he was setting an example for us because we need some rest. But we know from, from that example that God's power is limitless and it's effortless. God just spoke the word and everything in the world was creating. Nothing is too hard for God. And Paul says it should that uh, all of us should be able to just look at creation and know there's a God, know that there is a designer, know that there is a maker, and that whoever designed it and made it is wise and is powerful. Paul in, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 said, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Paul says that no one's going to be able to stand before God on the day of judgment and say, well, you know, I just didn't know there was a God. No, he says they are without excuse. You can't look at creation and not make at least those two conclusions that somebody more powerful than you made it and whoever made it is very, very powerful. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40 and Verse 26 said, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. I mean, you can't, you can't go out at night and look up to the stars, especially if you get out of town a little bit and you're able to actually see stars and not realize that God is all-powerful. Just, just look at nature. I mean, last night... Uh, we were, we were out in Wiley, and, and we were leaving and a, a place where we were. And, and this, I don't know if any of y'all saw Did any of y'all see the sunset last night? I almost came back to your house and told everybody to come out, but I couldn't get people's attention. It was, it was an incredible sunset. There was a storm, you know, that was kind of dividing halfway through the sky. And then there was lightning in that storm. And then the sun was just a giant orange ball that was going down, and there were streaks going up. And, and I got a picture of it with a flag, and the picture doesn't do it justice. You just couldn't help but praise God when you see something like that. Just go out and take a walk in the morning, in, in the evening, when the sun's rising or the sun's setting. God's creation speaks of his power. And the second thing I want us to talk about, his power is evidenced by the life and ministry of Christ. Uh, Jesus, one thing he did is he demonstrated God's power working through him throughout his ministry. He had power over nature. You know, he, he could be out in, in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and a, and a storm come up that all the these sailors that he's with think they're going to drown and he just says two words, be still. And the sea becomes just as calm as glass because he has power over nature. He had power over disease. A leper, you know, that they thought was incurable would come up and he would say to him, be clean. And immediately, you know, his leprosy was gone. Or someone who had been blind from birth and Jesus would just say, Open your eyes. And he would, and he could see. Or, or someone who was lame and, and wasn't able to walk. You know, for 38 years, remember that guy who was laying by the pool of Siloam trying to get healed. And, and, and Jesus just said, pick up your mat and walk. And, he, and his legs were strengthened immediately. And immediately he was healed. Uh, Jesus had power over disease. And Jesus had power over death. Didn't matter how long a person had been dead. Uh, Lazarus. Four days in the tomb, all wrapped up. They thought he was beginning to decompose and stink. Or a little 12-year-old girl, Jairus' daughter, who had just died in her bed. 
Jesus just said, get up to that little girl, and she did. Jesus said, come forth to Lazarus, and he came out with his grave clothes all wrapped around him. Their lives were restored, were resurrected. Jesus' life was God's greatest testimony to his power. Now, maybe the way God confirmed this power the, the most is when he raised Jesus from the dead, his own son. They killed him. They put him in a tomb. They sealed it up. They put soldiers out in front of it to guard him to make sure that no one came and stole his body. They left him there for three days. But when God had had enough, God said, wake up. And Jesus did to never die again. You know, those, those people, Lazarus and that little girl that Jesus raised, they did die again. But Jesus arose conquering death to never die again. He ascended to heaven and he's coming back for us. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. And he will raise us also. And that's what gives us hope. Uh, this, this life is not the end. We will be raised as well. All right. Now, have I said anything that you disagree with so far today? Have I said anything that you don't already know? Anything that you don't believe? You know, you came today. You wouldn't have come today if you didn't know God was powerful. But let me just talk about another issue. <clears throat> A lot of Christians believe God was powerful in Bible days. But those days are over. And sometimes we don't really expect him to do anything very powerful today. Anybody struggle with that? Do, do we have an unwritten list? I mean, we wouldn't dare write it down, but an unwritten list we keep in our heads that if we were to have to title it, we'd call our too hard for God list, our too hard for God to change list, our too hard for God to make a difference list. Um, do we have a list like that? You know, if we if we do have a list like that, we're not alone. Because some people in the Bible did too. For instance, uh, Abraham and Sarah. Man, Abraham and Sarah had great faith. They left their land in Ur. They traveled to the Promised Land. They, you know, they they wandered around for all those years. God had promised them. You know, right when they left Ur, I guess He promised them that they were going to have a son, and that this son through him would come someone who would bless all the nations of the earth. And then they waited. You know, they they tried 25 years. Couldn't have a baby, or couldn't have a son. Well, didn't have a baby. Couldn't have a son. They, they used Hagar to try to see if that worked. work. Israel came, that didn't work. And now, you know, they reach a point where it's not even biologically possible. Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90. Paul said of them in Romans 4 that, you know, they were just as good as dead. How would you like the doctor to tell you that at your, at your uh, physical? You know, they, they, they've given up hope. And then God showed up one day in Genesis 18 and, and said, Sarah, you're going to have a baby about this time next year. And you remember what Sarah did? She laughed, right? She laughed. Because, you know why she laughed? It's because that was on her too hard for God list. She had given up. But look what the Lord said to Abraham. Why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? And notice this next line. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And you know the story. She did have a son. God gave him power somehow. And in her old age, she bore Abraham a son, and they named him, remember, Isaac, which means laughter. I love that uh, name for a kid. Uh, and that gets at the heart of uh, what I want us to talk about today. I want you to ask yourself, what's on your too hard for God list? And I want you to ask yourself, is there anything too hard for God? And I want you to ask yourself, are you plugged into his power? So let's look at the second part of the lesson. Let's talk about this, this truth that God is able. Thank you for leading that song. I might go ahead and sing that in a long time. God is able. You know, God is able, because he's all-powerful, to do anything he wants to do. But I want us to talk about three things uh, right now that uh, God is able to do in our lives by his power. And the first thing, he's able to enter your situation, whatever your situation is, God is able to enter into it and help you by his power. Uh, and as an example, you remember in the Gospels, Zechariah and Elizabeth, a godly couple, they wanted to have a baby so bad, and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed, God, please give us a baby, and they never had one. And now uh, they're old, Elizabeth is too old physically to have a baby. But you remember one day the angel showed up while Zechariah was working in the temple. He was a Levite. He was working in the temple one day. That didn't happen very often, but it was his turn. And uh, an angel appeared to him, uh, Gabriel. And Gabriel said to him in Luke 1 and verse 13, 
The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Now, they hadn't prayed that prayer in years, probably. But God had heard it years ago, and now it is the time to answer it. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Now, remember I said that uh, Zechariah was a Levite. And one of the things Levites did is they went around and, to people, and they talked them the word of God. And, and I'm sure that Zechariah's Levite had taught the story of Abraham and Sarah multitudes of times to lots of people how God had answered their prayers and in their old age, very old age, had given them uh, Isaac. Uh, but when God says, you and Elizabeth are going to have a son, it's a different story. He doesn't really believe it. Because look at verse 18. You remember this story. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And we, we don't have time to read it all, but basically Gabriel says, oh, be quiet. It's basically what Gabriel said. And he was quiet. He couldn't speak for the next nine months uh, until John was born. And he said, name of John. And then he could speak again and he prophesied and all that good stuff. But, uh, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, uh, he believed God was powerful in the past, but not so much in his life right then. Does that apply to any of us? But then in that same chapter, we get a, we get a better example because the same angel Gabriel goes to see uh, a girl, probably a teenage girl, uh, named Mary, who was a virgin. And Gabriel, you know, tells her something that's going to happen to her that's a lot harder to believe than what he told uh, Zechariah was going to happen to him and Elizabeth. Because, you know, nothing like what's going to happen to Mary had ever happened before. At least Zechariah and Elizabeth, they could look back to Abraham and Sarah. Uh, but, you know, he tells her, She's been chosen to have a baby who will be God's son. And naturally, when she hears that, since she's a virgin, she asks in verse 34, How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, she's not asking out of doubt. She's asking for information. Because nothing like this has ever happened before. I mean, this is impossible. And God doesn't rebuke her. You know, the angel doesn't say, you, You're not going to be able to speak. You know, he doesn't do anything. He just gives her an answer. Verses 35 through 37, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, here's some evidence. Your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. And then notice this last part. For nothing will be impossible with God. Now, she has been told to believe something much harder than Zechariah had been told, but she doesn't doubt she doesn't let what God had never done before in the past keep her from believing God could do it for her in the present. So she said, Luke 1 verse 38, with great faith, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. And I'm sure she didn't understand how all this was going to happen. I mean, do we understand it? Does anybody really understand Holy Spirit conception? I don't think any of us do. But she believed in an all-powerful God who could enter into her situation and do what seemed impossible. So let me ask you, is that what we believe? You know, it's one thing to believe God was powerful. We believe all these stories in the Bible. But it's another thing entirely to believe that God can enter into your situation today and he can make a difference, that he can change you know, what seems unchangeable. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to force anybody. It's, if, if it's his will and if we're willing to cooperate with him, uh, he can change the unchangeable. Aren't you glad God doesn't shut us up every time we doubt his power working in us today? Because if he is, if he shut us up every time we doubt his power, I probably wouldn't be up here speaking. I don't know. Maybe you'd be up here speaking. I don't know if God would have heard any of us singing. Maybe we would have all been real quiet. Uh, we wouldn't spread any germs that way. But anyway, uh, that's the first thing. God is powerful enough. He's able to enter your situation. And secondly, God is able to end your slavery. There is no bondage that God is powerful, uh, that is not powerful enough to overcome. God is powerful enough to overcome any bondage, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know, as an example, in the book of Jeremiah, you uh, the whole book of Jeremiah is about Jerusalem is about to fall to Babylon into captivity. And, and Jeremiah is warning the people and he's trying to get them to repent and all this stuff. And, and he's been, you know, this has been his ministry for years. Nobody listened to him. And, you know, he's a weeping prophet and all that stuff. And, and, but right in the middle of, of all that, when he's telling the people they're going to be taken to captive, 
all of a sudden God tells them to go out and buy a field in Israel. And that seems crazy. That seems counterproductive. Here they are about to go into captivity into Babylon a thousand miles away. Why would God tell them to go buy a field in Israel right before it happens? And the reason is because buying that field would be a sign of hope to the people that God wasn't giving up on them, that God still had a future for them, even though they were going into Babylon. Hope that, hope that makes sense. But look what Jeremiah 32 says. It says. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. You're saying about this city, Jerusalem, by the sword, famine, and plague, it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon. And that's what happened. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I will surely gather them from all the lands where I banished them in my furious anger and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. God's saying, yeah, they're going to go into captivity. But listen, there is no captivity. There's no slavery. That's too hard for me to release my people from. And that's the message for us. There's no chain. There's no prison. There's no wall that God's people can ever get behind that God cannot deal with in his power. And after 70 years, you remember your Bible history. Uh, we talked about it last week. Cyrus said the people could, could go back and, and they left their captivity and they came back to Israel. And I guess, well, Jeremiah, I guess, wasn't there, but... But anyway, he had bought his, his land. Maybe his descendants got it. Didn't God ultimately prove this at the resurrection that he can release us from any bondage that has us in its grip when Jesus broke the bonds of death, the ultimate bondage? You know, we believe in Jesus' resurrection. We believe that we're going to be resurrected someday. But how many of us are living lives powered by the resurrection? That's what Paul said he wanted. He wanted to be powered by the resurrection. In Philippians 3, verse 10, he said, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. There is power to live for Jesus powerfully when we tap into that power. And listen to this great passage, Ephesians 1. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. But notice this part. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. You hear what that's saying? Paul wants us to know that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to work in us and through us. And I don't know if we really believe that. If we really tap into that. Uh, but there are Christians who can testify about it. I'm sure there are Christians, probably some here today, who can say, I once was in chains. You know, I was hooked on drugs. I was addicted to porn. I was an alcoholic. I was a workaholic. I had a violent temper. I had a filthy mouth. I, I had a marriage that was almost dead. And they never thought they would be released from those chains until they met the power of the resurrected Christ and God working through them and they are living free today from those bonds. Thanks to God. God is able to end your slavery. Amen. So if anybody here today is in slavery, uh, what God asks of you is to just start walking in the direction of obedience and faith to him. Just start taking a step towards God. You know, for, for example, uh, you can think of the Israelites in the book of Joshua. God told them when, when they got to, before they entered into the land, they were on the other side of the Jordan, and God told them to go across the Jordan. And that wouldn't normally be a problem because the Jordan was kind of like the Trinity, I think, except one time a year when it was in flood stage. And it was about a, a mile across, and it was a raging river, and that's where it was at that time. And, and God said... To, the, to Joshua, he said, have the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant in front of the people, and all the people followed, and then crossed the river. And, you know, it's like God didn't know it was flooding. And so they start walking towards the river, and the waters are still coming. And, you know, if they all step into that water, they're going to be swept away and drowned. Uh, and, and God doesn't stop the water until those priests get right up to the edge, and they put their feet into the water, and, and then God stops the, the flow upstream at a town called Adam, I think, somewhere up by the Sea of Galilee, stops the water upstream, and, and the water stops running. And they, they're able to walk across uh, on dry ground. But they had to take that step of faith out into that water first. 
And, and sometimes that's the way it works for us. God says you start walking in the direction of faith. You start walking in faith in the direction of obedience uh, towards my will. And I'll give you the power along the way to do it. But it's one step at a time. It's one day at a time. And we say, wait, God, I want you to give me all the power right now so I know I'm going to be able to do this. And then I'll be obedient. And God says, no, it doesn't always work that way. You be faithful today. You be obedient today. And I'll give you the power you need for today to break your chains. One day at a time. God's able to end your slavery. And then thirdly, God is able to ensure your salvation. I heard a story that years ago, one of the astronauts who had stood and walked on the moon's surface, he was asked this question. What thought was in your mind as you walked on the moon's surface and looked at the earth some 200,000 miles away? And he said, well, to be honest, I remember thinking how my spacecraft was built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> Didn't sound real confident, you know. Um, look, if I'm taking a major trip, I want to be able, I want to be sure that I'm able not, able not only to get there, but I want to be able to get back, you know. Um, but a lot of Christians aren't very sure of their salvation by going to heaven. You know, if I was to ask you today, uh, are you going to, are you sure you're going to be in heaven? Uh, I wonder, you know, what we would all say. Uh, I hope so. It's not really a very comforting answer. Um, and sometimes the problem is maybe we're not sure about the power of God to, to keep us safe. Uh, in Matthew 19, there was a rich young really, you know, a story. He was very moral. He was very decent. He was the kind of young man. You want your daughter to marry. And he came up to Jesus with a very good question. What, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and they had a conversation. But basically, bottom line, Jesus said to him, you have to put me ahead of everything else in your life, even your wealth. So give it all away and come follow me. And you remember the young man went away sad because he had great wealth and uh, he put it first. That, that was where, what he trusted in, not in Jesus. And, but the disciples, you know, they were amazed that Jesus would turn this man away and not go running after him and say, hey, I was just, I, I was just testing you, I was just teasing you, come on, uh, let's not be so serious about this. But Jesus didn't do that. They figured this guy was everything God would want in a person. But, you know, the passage here says, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? If this guy can't be saved, who can? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. <clears throat> Maybe the reason they were astonished is the same reason so many Christians are not sure about their salvation. Because Christians worry about their salvation often because they think it all depends on their own power. It all depends on their own morality, on their own decency, on their own works. There is a feeling that we must earn it. We don't get anything free. We must earn it. And so we ask questions like, have I done enough? And have I lived good enough? And the answer to those questions are, no one can ever do enough to save themselves. Our good works are like filthy rags, Isaiah 64 says. And no one can live good enough to save themselves because all it takes is one sin and we're all sinners. And we, we all fall short of the glory of God and no one is righteous, no, not one. If we are trying to save ourselves, if we're, we're trying to you know, save ourselves by our own morality and strength, we're doomed to failure. We're totally dependent on the mercy and grace and the blood of Christ. My salvation doesn't depend primarily on my stronghold on God. It depends primarily on God's stronghold on me. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be saved. You know, it is conditional. We must obey the gospel. But most of us here have. If, if you have obeyed the gospel, if you've been baptized and you've had the blood of Jesus wash away your sins. And if 1 John 1 and verse 7 applies to you, 1 John 1 and verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. If you're walking in the light, that doesn't mean perfection. Please, it doesn't mean I mean, no one can walk in the light that perfectly. It means you're trying. It means you're trying to live the way God wants you to live. And you're stumbling and falling but you, you, you haven't left Jesus, you're holding on to Jesus, uh, then you can know that the blood that cleansed you at baptism is continually cleansing. When it says it purifies us, that's in the present tense, which means it's a continual cleansing, constant cleansing. Uh, so if I stay with Jesus, Satan is powerless to do anything about taking me away from my salvation. 
Listen to these great scriptures. 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until this day. He's able. He's strong. He's mighty. He's all powerful. And if I put my faith in him and believe him and obey him and I'm trying to follow him, then, then he's the one that's going to keep me safe. He guards what I've entrusted to him. I've given it to him. I've trusted him in my salvation. He guards it. Who better to guard it than the almighty, all-powerful God? And then Hebrews 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is, yeah, he is able. He's all-powerful. He's mighty to save completely. I love that word. To save completely those who come to God through him in Jesus. Because he always lives to intercede for them. And Jesus is interceding for us right now when we slip up and we mess up, which we do every day. Um, Jesus there, he pleads our case. His blood cleanses us. When God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of his son. We can know that he saves us completely. And then in this last passage, Jude 24, to him who is able, he's mighty, he's strong, to keep you from stumbling. He gives us the Holy Spirit to help us so we won't stumble and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. I mean, someday we're going to stand before his glorious presence. The only way we can stand without fault is because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. We've clothed ourselves with Christ. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus' righteousness. He doesn't see our sins because Jesus took our sins. God is able to save us. Is my salvation up to my ability or is it up to God's ability? You know, if it's all on me, it's impossible. But what's impossible for me is not too hard for God and his almighty power and his grace. Uh, he will save us if we stay with Jesus, if we stick with him. He's able to ensure your salvation. So let me just ask you, what do you need to take off of your too hard for God list? What's on your too hard for God list? You need to strike a pin mark through this morning because he is able. Now I haven't had time to talk about how we must plug into his power. Let me just give you give me give me a minute. We must plug into his power. We do so by reading the word of God. That's the power source. We do so by praying every day to him. We do so by being part of a fellowship, being part of a church where we can come and we can be encouraged and we can worship together and we can we can uh, serve together. Uh, you know, plug into his power and then do something with that power. Don't just talk. Do something. Act. Serve in ways you haven't served before. Take a risk. Talk to someone about Jesus. Trust him to give you the power you need along the way, and he will do it. And let's not just talk. Let's, let's act. Uh, and listen, if this, as a church, if this is on your too hard for God list, for this church to grow and become a powerful body of believers, if that's on your too hard for God list, please take that off your list. Because God is almighty. Uh, he doesn't want this church or any church to be a place of slumber. He wants it to be a place of power, of God's power, of service to people and service to the community, of God's power, of proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the good news. And let's believe the best days for this church are still ahead of us. If we will tap into his power. And let him work through us. He will do great things for us. And we're not going to put all the pressure on the new preacher. We're not going to expect him to come in here and work miracles. But we're going to use that as a boost of enthusiasm. And, and a boost of, of faith. That God uh, is going to do great things through this church. If we can uh, help you today. Maybe there's someone here today that uh, could use some of God's power in your life. Uh, We'd love to pray with you, or perhaps uh, you're ready today to obey the gospel and be baptized. You know, when, you, when you're baptized, you know, your sins washed away. You're added to the church, and you also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, who helps you. Uh, so that, that gives you some power. If we can help you today, we invite you to come right now while we stand, while we sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other count I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon. 
but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this part clean, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Ben has, uh, Ben's drum has come forward. Ben's drum has come forward uh, this morning with a couple of prayer requests that uh, are badly needed. Um, Ben's uh, daughter, Christina, is down in Galveston with some, just a grandkids. Her, her, Lance's parents took their two boys to okay. Galveston. Okay, Lance, Lance's parents, Christina's husband's uh, parents took the two boys to uh, Em, 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 Elliot and Emerson to uh, Galveston and Emerson has a fever of 104 and they don't know what's wrong and uh, also uh, Ben has been doing some business with a lady named Stina Herndon no, and Stina Brown I think okay yeah there is Stina Brown uh, and she has a daughter named Brooke who was in a fatal car accident and uh, she is now in Fayetteville, Arkansas. So I assume that's where the accident took place. So let's bow and let's pray for, for these folks. Father, we're thankful that we can come to you with these needs that uh, Ben has brought before us, Lord. We know you're already well aware of what's going on with these families. We know you care, Father. And God, we pray that uh, you would be with with uh, Stina Brown, Father. We pray that you would comfort her in the loss of her daughter Brooke in this tragic uh, accident. Uh, Father, that you would wrap your arms around her. We pray she knows you, Lord. And uh, we pray, Father, that if she doesn't know you, she'll come and know you. Put her faith in you. But Lord, right now she just needs you to comfort her. So please bless her. And please be with Ben. He's able to reach out and and touch her life. And Father, we uh, we pray that you would be with uh, Emerson. We know he's just a little child, Lord. we hate to hear when a baby or a little child is uh, sick with a fever like that. So, Father, we don't know what's wrong. We know you do, Lord, so we ask for your intervention. We ask for your healing, Father. Pray that you be with Elliot. Pray that he won't get whatever it is. And pray that you comfort uh, Lance and Christina during this time and uh, Lance's parents, Father, and bring them back here safely. Thank you for hearing our prayers and loving us, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we prepare to close this morning. Again, if you're a guest, we're excited you're here. We hope we can get to know you a little bit and introduce ourselves. Uh, if you're watching at home, we are glad you joined us. And as I always like to say, let's make sure we share the love of Jesus wherever we go as we go out into the world. And remember that our God is powerful and he can do all things. So, And we can do all things because he gives us the strength. So let's remember that as we go out this, this, this week and serve our, serve our God. The God of the heavens, the ancient of days, the God of the Father, and God of the grace, the Alpha Omega, beginning and end. Before you now, we come to.
such a rich rich experience we're so thankful father for our our request is that you would dismiss us but give us an extra measure of your faith father and help us to believe help us to believe in your power we need an extra measure of your holy spirit that you promised us Help us to draw close to you and receive that power. Heavenly Father, help us to have the faith that you can help, you can help restore peace and tranquility in this troubled land. And more than anything else, Father, we pray that you'll, you'll let your will be done on earth. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.